All right, let's do it, man. Legend in the building. What's and we, going on? We we've been trying to we've been trying to connect for a little minute since I seen that video, man. Yeah, things been hectic on both our ends. You know, life's a little busy, but I'm glad we finally got it in. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So let me let let me get this straight. You you're you're an owner op company driver. What what are you? I'm an owner operator. Um, I own my truck and trailer. I've been in business for the past three years. Um, I used to be a company driver, but uh, I do music too, man. Uh, I, I tour with Snoop. I was in the Puff Puff Pass tour for a bit, um, and I saved my tour money by the truck and the trailer once the pandemic started. And yeah, we've just been going at it hard since. Okay, okay, hip hop. So let's let's take this one at a time, man. So, so your your hip hop journey. You 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 toured with the legends of hip hop. Did you yeah, did, yeah. did was you was you part of the Up in Smoke tour as well or no? Just the Puff Puff Pass tour. Yeah, it was just me, Rob Stone, and it was just mainly in Cali. You know, we did the House of Blues, a couple. You know, Summertime in the LBC. Um, I also toured with like Psycho Round and. Um, yeah, man, it's I've been doing that for a while. So, I mean, so you you're a hip hop artist, right? You're you're not the people that the grips, the key grips, or anything like that, right? You you the actual artist, right? Correct, correct. Yeah, I write my music. I also own a mechanic shop with my family. I do music uh, and I do the trucking thing. I'm also working on a book right now. I like to stay busy, man. I like uh, all the gifts that God gave me. I like to multiply them, you know. Okay, that's what's up, man. That's what's up. So how did you how how did you hook up with Snoop? How how all that came about? Um, you know what? I was releasing things on Instagram and he followed me on Instagram one day. And then his manager hit me up and they I signed contracts with him and we ended up just, you know, touring together. It, he yeah, he I obviously heard about him years ago, you know, I've been listening to Snoop my whole life. But yeah, he followed me. I guess he seen one of my videos on Instagram and told his manager about me. Then his manager signed. Me. So you you was up under up under Snoop Dogg's label. Um, it's a branch off of Snoop's label. Yeah, uh, we basically had the same manager. Okay, okay, okay. So talk to me, yeah. man, because I, I got a I got a cousin. Shout out to my cousin LeBron. His son Robert is uh the youngest uh producer for money bag rep uh records same same okay. story same story how he got found how you said that snoop started following you well this is about the same mm -hmm. thing that happened with uh with my little cousin he was just dropping beats on uh soundcloud and and money bag just happened to pick up on one of his beats he liked it he did something with it he called. He called my my uh my cousin back. Money bag signed him at the age of sixteen, bro. That's incredible. Yeah, That's I mean, incredible. yeah, and also, also, let me not forget. Let me give him his flowers. He's nominated for a Grammy this year. Jeez. I know, right? So you 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 wow. you, you you can't you can't understand how 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 the family is right now. That is yeah, we we are, we are super ecstatic. Just to be nominated is just is at just his what age. Is. At, at his part. age, right, right. So, all right. So you and uh, so you and Snoop, uh, did did y'all actually do music together, or you you just did your own music and just released it through his imprint? We would be in the studio together. You know, he took me to the compound. I was in studios. I was in the same compound he was. You know, Bishop Amon was there. Uh, Martha Stewart, Kevin Garnett was there. I had a cool, cool dope experience of being um, in his vicinity, you know, his area. Hold up. Yeah, wait, man, wait, we, wait, we, wait, wait. Oh, hold on. Hold up. <laughs> you, you said Martha Stewart. The Martha Stewart? Yeah. Good, man. Uh, double espresso macchiato with extra foam? Sure, that'll be 450 Yeah, she was there. She was there at the compound. And uh, yeah, man, it's it's uh, when you're around Snoop, you're around a lot of beautiful people. And um, I've I've been very fortunate enough to, you know, I got three kids, so I I, I pursue anything that 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 gives me income. You know, multiple sources of income is where it's at. So once I I did that and the pandemic started, you know, shows stopped. You know, um, everything was closed. 
and the money that I was making off tour with him is how I started the trucking company. And, um, you know, it was booming during the pandemic. You're making $13,000 a load, you know? And, uh, yeah, man, I, 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 uh, I still do music. I still, uh, you know, be at the shop and, uh, yeah, man. You saved up your money right after you got your CDLs. You, you just, just went on ahead and brought your own truck and trailer or you try to follow the imprint to learn the trucking before you brought your truck and trailer? Um, it basically came off of necessity. You know, um, I didn't go to like a trucking school or anything like that. I'm a YouTube graduate is what I like to call it. I, uh, I just went online because nobody wanted to invest in me. You know, nobody wanted to give me money to go to school. So I ended up just going to YouTube, studying all the tests, going to the DMV, getting the books there. I have a couple friends who are already in the industry. So I would go on the road with them to get behind the wheel, learn how to park, learn how to do all that stuff. I got my class A. I worked for a company for about a year and a half while I got my class A. And yeah, the, the money that I saved up is how I bought the truck and trailer. Um, and it was just a learning experience from there. I literally went in there with eyes closed. You know, I didn't know about dispatching. I didn't know about anything besides just driving and learning the industry. I, I, I noticed that when I started the company, everybody was just taking money, you know, people filling out carrier packets, uh, the dispatchers take a percentage, factoring companies take a percentage. But little by little, I started letting go of those people by just, you know, educating myself on what they do and understanding that they don't really do much. And, um, I ended up putting more money in my pocket to the point where, you know, I wake up in the morning, I book my own load, I work on my own truck, I do the maintenance on my truck. I, I basically do everything myself as much as I possibly can. And uh, yeah, that's that's how I ended up just learning the industry by necessity. You know, I didn't even know what a load board was. Um, I met some guy in St. Louis after some, some dispatcher was giving me low paying loads. And I was like, man, we're going to go broke like this. And I met some guy in St. Louis. I was like, Hey, how do you get your loads? You know, you know, you get a load board. I was like, what's the load board? And he was like, it's this, he showed it to me. I downloaded it. I pay $180 a month for it. And then I started learning how to dispatch. You know, I just, I started calling like, Hey, you know, I'm interested in this load. And they're like, what's your MC number? And I'm like, uh, and then they'd be like, yeah, you're new. And they would just hang up. So then I started learning like my pitch. Once I started learning my pitch, then I started learning how to negotiate my rates. Once I started negotiating my rates, then it was just full on me. Just wake up, drive, work on my shit, deliver the load. And, uh, yeah, it just became uh, uh, something natural after that. I'm, I'm going to have to give you a hand clap for that, man, because this sounds like you just took everything yourself and, and, and you just said, bump it. Let me just learn the ins and outs myself without going through any influencers or anything like that because you we got people out here selling courses like that bro uh you didn't buy into that or or was that a thought at one point nah, life life was the course trial and error you know um i got i've been double brokered before i've been taken advantage of before and then boom you know we took note of that never happened again and um it's just necessity you know like i said i got three kids and, you know, the music industry is wonderful, but I mean, if you're not pulling like, like, you know, Snoop got 2 billion streams on Spotify and that's only $42,000, you know, in this industry, you can make up to $30,000 a month. And that's when I started falling in love with it, where I was just like, you know, watching other artists that were peers selling clothes because, you know, they can't make more money off the stream, you know, and that's why I really stay stuck to it. I love music. That's my passion. That's my dream. That's my, uh, my zone is what it's called in Spanish, you know, the, the, the gift that God gave me, which I'll never let go of. But I am venturing into this to make it one of the biggest trucking companies in the world, one of the highest paying and, you know, basically putting drivers in a position to turn into owner operators, to earn their own trucks, to learn the industry themselves. And yeah, man, it, it's, it's just about expanding and not getting comfortable. What about, uh, what, what about these new artists and i'm i'm going to point towards the female artists especially towards the later part of the uh of 2022 we got the the boom of the female popularity we had sukiana now we got uh sexy red and everything and they claiming that that they making the money and they getting it is it because that they're they're females and they're 
sexuality or or is they really making money like nah, that? Nah, people, uh, you know, once you once you build a certain amount of popularity, people will pay you just to show up places. I'm sure that woman makes a fortune. Most of those artists make a fortune just showing up to the place, you know. And um, that's that's really where a lot of money comes from. Show money and and um, appearance money. Uh, the stream money, album sales, isn't the same as it used to be. These women are making money. Most of those artists who are popping are, are making money just by showing up. And if they perform, you're talking about if they're popping, they got a couple of hits on, you're talking about $100,000 a show. And then, you know, they're not even really performing. They're rapping over their song. Performances aren't like how they used to be. You know, it's not like a live band with, with, with you know, they're not Alicia Keys, and, you know, they're not on the piano singing their heart out. And it, the, the times have changed. You know, there's, I'm not dogging it at all. Praise to them. Praise to anybody who builds such a such a pedestal for themselves that you know people will pay them just to show up. People will pay them, you know, less than a quarter mil just to perform a few songs. It's, it's not like they're performing two hours. You know, they're not doing full concert. You know, they're just there three songs and take the bag and they're out. You know, and they got to do that as much as they can because. Once your popularity starts dying down, the pays on the show start going down. The venues get smaller mm. um, and the appearances pay is less. Mm. And then, you know, you could call it falling off or you could call it as, you know, that's the next man's turn or the next woman's turn, you know? One hit wonders, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Do you do you think as of as of right now, how Sessie Red's popularity is is kind of booming right now? Do you do you think do you think the next couple of tracks that she gonna have to make, uh, gonna have to still sustain that that uh, that flow for her in order to still remain relevant? I feel like she's got um, a good production team. Whoever's making her beats has fifty percent to do with what her success is at, you know. And then everything else is, you know, obviously her own character. Uh, sex sells dramatically right now, but it's always sold, you know. Uh, you know, uh, my neck my bag you know it's been it's been there people say like oh you know people are are uh you know messing up their young girls heads like even back in the day you know no one no short short man it's just been there you know it's just some people always got someone to say and they feel like their their comment or their opinion on something is like a new one and they're like nah it's just it's just been nasty it's been dirty out here since the 50s is when people was trying to, like, you know, be clean and look good for their neighbor. And, you know, we don't have problems. But times have changed, you know. I think her relevance is going to always be there as long as she keeps rocking, you know, tracks. As long as she keeps doing good features. She'll be all right. Why don't you make me a double espresso macchiato with extra foam? You got it. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Why don't you make it like your life depends on? Music has changed throughout the 50 years of hip hop right now. We, I, I grew up in the era of Run DMC, Rakim, KRS One. I, I grew up with those guys. I, I grew up with uh, Master Cass. I grew up with Brand New Brand. You know what I'm saying? And then later down in life, yeah. uh, I, I, I gravitated over to, over to the West Coast, NWA, Dr. Dre, Snoop Dogg. And, and the rest of those cats over there. But now, the way that music is so set up right now and how it has changed over the years, what's your, I mean, what, what's your outlook, uh, your outlook on it? Do you think social media and, and the internet made, made music good or it made music bad considering how things was back in the day? You know what? I think what it's done is it's made, uh, you know, the talented people not shine as much as the popular people. You know, it's a popularity contest now. Uh, you, you can have someone who literally sings amazing, writes amazing, but if they don't got that right look and they're not gravitating the right people, they're not going to pop off. Talent, talent just doesn't do it no more. You know, you got, you look, look at blue faces, uh, you know, just got a, a deal off of her first song. You know, and that was all a uh, negative buzz, you know, I'm fighting with her baby daddy, you know, like crazy shit like that. That That's not, oh, nobody was like, wow, this is an artist that's extremely talented and boom, boom, boom. Like, nah, this is someone who's popular right now. Let's give her a deal. Let's see how much money we can make off of these, 
these, um, you know, shows with her, how many appearances she could make. I don't think it's, it's just made everybody think everybody's a somebody now, you know, when James Brown was alive, you know, you're not going to find another 30 James Brown. You know, James Brown is James Brown. And, and that's the difference between like right now you've got like 30,000, you know, like it's, there's just thousands and thousands of duplicates of the same person. Like even when like Future and, and, and that guy designer came out, it sounded exactly the same, but he he wasn't as popular as him. So his longevity wasn't there. Future still pop it, you know, and, uh, and, and not as much as he used to though, you know? So I, I think, I think, uh, it's not even about music anymore. I feel like a lot of people don't even listen to the music being put out. A lot of people are still listening to KRS-One. A lot of people are still like, you know, living in that world because that's the music that still captivates the soul. That still, you know, brings them out of a dark place. None of the music you're hearing now, besides like, you know, before XXX died or like Pop Smoke or like most of the artists that do do something that do captivate the soul, they die. And I don't think that's nothing short of a coincidence. No. You made an excellent point on that, man. Pop Smoke, SSS to Tension, uh, Core Mega, Big L. Man, Youth you, World, you, Young Dolph. Dude. You know what I mean? Oh. Like people who really did it on their own, like they're gone. They're gone. And I don't I don't think that's a coincidence, man. I just think that people want to knock out the next best thing. You know, like, uh, you know, they say Drake killed XXX. You can see that. That could be very possible. You know, 50 would have. Pop Smoke would have been his replacement easily. Pop Smoke would have just took over by storm, you know? These are all artists that really had something that was like, God damn, like I feel fucking cool as fuck listening to this. And when's the last time that you felt that, you know? Like you felt goosebumps listening to somebody, you know? And uh, it's not like that no more. People listen to something and they're like, uh, I bet you that's going to pop off because it's stupid as fuck. You know, my pussy pink and my booty hole brown. Like, come on, man. Like, and, 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 and it's like, it popped off. It popped off because it was that ridiculous. It was that. I thought it was a joke when I heard that. Right. I, I thought it was uh, too. I, I still think it's a joke, but yeah. You know, and it, and it blew up. And, and before, I don't know if you remember, we used to blame these radio stations. That, uh, that we used to be like, oh, they dictate what we listen to. Like, man, I sure do miss the days when they did that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, because the shit we listen to now is just like, what the fuck is this? You know, like, you can't be in the car with your family and your kids playing certain shit. You know, like, and, and fuck it. If they're making money off of it and it works, juice the limit. You know, juice it. But are they going to be proud of themselves when they're 85 years old and the legacy they left behind and when music changes again, it's going to be kind of embarrassing, you know? Right. You being from the West Coast and and being linked up with the greats like Snoop Dogg and the rest of them, have you had anything with uh, Nipsey Hussle? Rest in peace to Nipsey. We did a show with Nipsey, yeah. I did a show at an arena at the uh, Ontario Arena with Nipsey. And we crossed paths. I was like, what's up, man? I like, was getting on phone, but I never got um, the honor to, you know, exchange words with him. And to be honest with you, uh, Nipsey didn't get his flowers till he passed away. You know what I mean? And um, that's when people were like, "Oh shit, you know, this man was different." And that's what sucks too. You know, that's another person on the list that passed away early. And and uh, you know, the the greats, the greats, they 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 leave early, man. It would have been dope to be on a track with Nipsey, but to be, you know, transparent with you. I never really listened to Nip before he passed away. I never heard a Nip record. I had a couple friends who, you know, really hustled, really were part of the streets and like, man, you got to listen to Nipsey. You got to listen to Nipsey. And I never gave it the shot till, you know, he didn't go platinum till he, you know, he was Grammy nominated as himself, you know, and uh, if he didn't, he didn't shine till he passed away and nobody gave him his flowers till he passed away. But that would have been, the fact that I was able to share stages with him was, was a, an extreme blessing. How did you come to find out of of his passing, and how did that make you feel? It was everywhere online. Um, it was it was literally people were recording him on the ground. I don't know if you remember those videos that they took off shortly after, where he was shot. The paramedic was like flipping him over and trying to get some CPR and stuff. And uh, it was like, oh shit, this is that artist that you know my boy was talking about. That's when his whole story was being brought to everybody like a documentary. I'm from LA. A lot of artists get shot and die, you know, 
And um, so to hear somebody get shot, it was like, oh, okay, he got shot. He'll probably be all right. But, but when he died, it was just kind of like, damn, there goes another one. You know, like another another person could have had an outstanding career if it wasn't for the environment we live at in LA. You know, I'm a grown ass businessman now, and um, I did have my days of ruthlessness and immaturity. And he was he was in that place, you know, talking about Bitcoin. He was a businessman now, but unfortunately, that life he used to live that took him down is just like man, like it it it. it it's upsetting. It, it, it was definitely upsetting to find out when it happened, but for the reason it happened and how it happened, it was just kind of like, well, it would go again. Type of thing, you know. Now the life of of Los Angeles, California, California in in general. I come as I was growing up, being a teenager, watching it on TV and see how you guys live over there. How you actually being from L.A. and from that time frame, how, how was it for you growing up in in those times back then? Um, You know what? I, I've always been neutral in my life. My pops never let me gangbang. You know? I was friends with everybody who was everybody. So sometimes one of my boys from his hood would kill another one of my boys from their hood. And, you know, growing up in that, it's just like you can't pick sides. And it's just, it's, um... I love LA. I love the chemistry in LA. I love the way we dress. I love the way we talk. I just wish we were, I just wish that we could grow past this. You know what I mean? And the kids that we have, like, it's not like how it used to be. It used to be way worse. You know what I mean? And now it's more hipster. You know what I'm saying? It, the gangs are still there, but it's not like how it was before. You know, like people would take pride on being a fuck up. But then, you know, once you have enough people go to prison and be like, you know what, this ain't it. I'm, I'm, I'm tatted up everywhere. But I was never tatted up because, oh, you know, I want to represent some. I just love art. I love, I love the presence it brings. I love, you know, but being from LA and educating myself and becoming a businessman and understanding that there was way more to life than what it is in LA to what it is that shows us on TV and the music videos and, you know, having children of my own and letting them know that the coolest shit they could do is be like nobody else, you know, really made me feel like I wasted a lot of years uh, being a product of my environment. Oh, it did make me a better man, a stronger man, a man without fear. Like, what's up? You want to fucking throw some chunk up? Let's get down. You know what I'm saying? That's definitely a necessity in life that you need, you know, to know you shouldn't fear no man, you know. And I feel like that's what L.A. really does to you. You could be, you know, five foot four and you still be like, what's up? You know, like that's that's what it is out there. And I think that I don't know. I, I just think that that's a necessity to become a man. Like it really made me a man growing up in a place where nobody gives a fuck about nothing, not even themselves, you know. God damn, Jimmy, this some serious gourmet shit. Me and Vincent would have been satisfied with some freeze-dried taster's choice, right? <laughs> and he springs this serious gourmet shit on us. What flavor is this? Knock it off, Chewy. What? I don't know. You said uh, tattoos. Now, I I personally don't have none, but I, I do uh, like them, especially if they're some good tattoos shout out to uh my girl rocket by billy she she got some bomb some bomb dope ass tattoos laid out uh on her body so for your tattoo journey man like what was your first tattoo and uh, what was the significance of it and how many tattoos you have to date um well the first person i ever seen get tatted was my pop so he really has everything to do with why I even thought it was cool to get tats, you know. And my pops used to bang and um, do all this stuff. So, you know, my dad was a, he was a real last man, you know. He always worked his ass off and blah, blah, blah. So it's not like he was tatted up and just a waste of life. So me getting tatted up and working hard and people being like, why you got so many tattoos? Because like, that was my, that was my example of a man, you know, a man who works hard is supposed to be tatted up. That's what my dad was. So my first tattoo was on my stomach. And I did it at like 15, 16 years old on a kitchen counter. And after that, I just kind of fell in love with the feeling. I fell in love with the art. And um, I met a lot of amazing tattoo artists. You know, shout out to my boy Doughboy. Shout out to my boy Steve. My boy A.B. Alvarez. Incredible artists who do incredible tattoo work. And uh, yeah, man, the, that, you know, being tatted up you, you, and, and, and understanding that, 
you can meet the nicest people with tattoos on their face, kind people. You know what I mean? A lot of people get intimidated by that shit. If I see someone all blasted up, you know, blasted up, it's just kind of, oh, that's probably a really kind person. And that person probably does really good business. And, you know, not everybody. I'm not talking about the tweakers on the streets and blah, blah, blah. I'm talking about, like, businessmen, you know. And there's nothing more dope looking than someone in a suit just tatted up with a Rolex on and just, like, being like, man, I wonder what that person's story is, you know. And the more tattoos I got, the more comfortable I felt in my own skin. I don't know if that makes any sense. It makes plenty of sense, man. Tattoos tell a story. So at least that's yeah. what what she told me and how she was explaining to me the the significance of her tattoos. Every tattoo she has, it, there's a story behind it. So you're right. It, tattoos tell a story. And getting the right tattoo artist to work on your body is is a good thing, too. So how did you go by vetting these tattoo artists to do the work on your body, bro. Well, you know what? You know what's a blessing that I had is um, I haven't really paid for any of my tattoos. Um, the music thing really um, brought a lot of tattoo artists in my life where they were like, yo, bro, like, I just want to tattoo up. Like, I just want you to have my work on you. And uh, I never really had a plan on what I was going to get on me and how it was going to go Late, later on in time I did. Um, but I would just look at their work. They would be like, here, like, pick something. Like, this is what I drew last week. This is what I drew here. Like, just tell people that I charged you, you know? And uh, music, music did that. Music music is the one, the reason why I have everything covered up on me. And, and I was just going off of dope-ass work that they had. Like, they would just give me these books of their, their work. Like, well, I, you know, I really want to do this one. I really want to do this one. My back piece is a full-on back piece. It took over, like, 10 hours, 12 hours. And it was a dope-ass like just painting my boy did and I was like man this it's like a Medusa and I was like this this really makes me feel like the women in my so it's a Medusa with her eyes closed and what that represented to me was just like no woman ever you know had me enough to where it made me in a stone if that makes any sense you know and um I I loved it and little by little I would just see more art and like her, you know I have Pomona on me I'm from I'm from Pomona, and um, yeah, man, it's just dope-ass art that was given to me by amazing artists, and that's how I just continue to feel my skin. Okay, okay, because my next question, I, I was going to ask you, what was your most expensive tattoo? But I guess you just explained it, that the artists meeting other artists, they just wanted to get their work out, and I can understand, especially that that's being it intertwine with hip hop, you know what I'm saying? Because you're right. you're out there performing and everything and people see you and then they see they they see the work. Somebody is gonna somebody is gonna reach out to you and be like, hey bro, that back piece or that that chest piece yeah. or that arm, that sleeve, who did that? And then you can right. oh, and you can also also, you know, shout out to my boy Saul and my boy Orcs. Um they're also amazing artists that are on me. And these are all, like, really, really heavy in the game tattoo artists. Like, fly out different parts of the world, you know, tattoo nene. Like, these are all artists that, you know, definitely every time someone does see it, they're like, who did this? Who did that? So you're, you're, you're definitely correct with that. I get hit up with that all the time. And I'm always handing out, like, either business cards that they leave me or, like, you know, just, oh, here, follow them on Instagram. You know, tell them I sent you, boom, 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 type thing. Now, let me ask you this before we move on. I, I, I would say like a little like a little bit where reality TV came into play and pretty much everything had to be a, a reality, a reality show. We, we, we got a reality show just about any type of niche out there. When they started featuring tattoo artists, I, I came across the one young lady. I forgot her name, but she was real popular. She had a shop out in L.A. Uh, she started with a with a small shop uh, that was again on uh, on reality TV, and then she manifested into her own reality TV show. But I believe her shop got burnt down for some reason, and she pretty much fell off. Like just went poof. Do you think artists like tattoo artists? that was underground 
that does real good work and everything in order and let's say they get picked up by reality or reality TV. Do you think they work take a hit to be watered down for TV? Do you do you do you think they will sacrifice that to to, to get that TV publication? I, I I guess if I'm saying that right, do you, do you think that, or do you have you ever met anybody that had that that had happened to? You know what? I do have homies who actually got offered, and they did not go with it. You know, um, and then some of them did. Um, and and uh, you know, in LA, that that was a big thing. There was a lot of people trying to cash out on tattoo shops. You know. And uh, I don't think it does anything to the artist. I just think uh, anything, any type of shine changes people. I don't I want to necessarily say it's the TV shows, you know. Anybody who didn't have clients before and is booked all year now would definitely change their character and they're walking with the head a little bit higher. You know, I don't think it has to do anything with the show. I don't even think it takes a show for someone to change why they act a certain way. I think... Um, once you get a certain buzz, you start feeling yourself a little more. You start just moving different, you know? I, I want to thank you for, you know, coming on the platform, sharing your stories. I'm really having a good time right now, man. I mean, Snoop Dogg, all the all the artists, the great artists that you came across and, and that you had some type of dealings with, your tat stories and everything, man. It, it's, it's, it's real great to meet you, man. So let's let's talk about what actually brought us together, man. Uh, you was pulled over, uh, or it looked like in the video you was you was at a rest area or a truck stop or something like that, and you got a ticket for just just being the rest. I mean, being at a rest area, and you you kind of went on a little rant, which which <laughs> resonate with just about every truck driver here, man. So. Take us back to what happened that day. Vincent, I'm on the intercom. So it was a uh, Christmas break, you know, and um, I parked my truck in the same spot that I always park it at. I've never had a problem. But once other truck drivers start seeing a truck at a certain place, they'll start parking their trucks there too. And it was uh, it was a street that's uh, away from another street. I don't know how to kind of put that for you, but there's a divider in the middle from the main street and there's a divider and then there's another street and then there's a gym. There's a gym right there. So I was parked in front of a gym that has its own kind of like street in front of it with a divider in front of it away from the main street. So I'd always park my truck there, never got a ticket, never got no problems, but you know, a lot of other people started parking there. And I was done with Christmas break. My son went to school. And I went to my truck and I want to go warm up my truck. You know, you got to warm up any, any diesel truck before you start driving it, you know? And I noticed that I had a ticket on the window and I was like, so I got the ticket. And as I look up, the cop who put the ticket is driving right by me, looks me in the eye and I just throw, you know, a little deuce up. Like I just, you know, said, what's up? So then as he does that, I was just like, man, I just finished seeing my kids. I'm about to get back to work. And this is what the fuck I got to start my day with, you know? And I wasn't even home for that long. I was home for like two days. So I'm warming up my truck to leave to work. And he comes up and he's just like, hey, you know, um, there's been a lot of trucks idling here. You're only allowed to be here for 24 hours. You're not allowed to be here for more than that. And, you know, as an owner operator, we already pay a lot of fines. We already pay a lot of stuff. And as he was driving up to me before he even addressed me, I was like, I'm going to record this conversation real quick. Just because any, I like, I have a lot of recordings like that. I have one where I tell off a highway patrol that I haven't posted yet, um, which I beat the ticket as well. Um, but I know a lot of these guys like to power trip on their position, you know? So just in case they were going to power trip on me, I always like to press record, you know? And uh, so as I was recording and he was just trying to tell me about this ticket, that I got at a place where I've always parked at, that's away from the streets, that's away from any type of traffic. There's no signs anywhere and it's in front of a gym, but it's a new rule now. He's like, hey, you can't park there for longer than 24 hours. And I'm just warming up my truck and he's talking about idling. And I don't know if you heard him mention, he said, the guy behind you was idling and I seen your truck. So he basically just gave me a ticket even though my truck was off just because the guy behind me was. 
And I just, I just, I go through a lot being an owner operator, man. I do all my paperwork, all my IFTA, every single little thing you could think of, I pay for. So to go through this after I was, you know, just seeing my son, I just, I just politely looked at him and I was like, how could I address this man and let him know what I actually do? You know what I mean? Like, and I just went off. I just politely talked about what I talk about with other truck drivers, you know, and I really just wanted to introduce him to the, the, the stupidity in the laws. Like a lot of people are like, oh, you know, laws are laws and boom, boom, boom. But when the pandemic was during play, we were heroes, supposedly. You know what I mean? And now that the world's normal, it's like, oh, you know, don't feel special. You know, you got to follow laws. We do not care. Right, right. The pandemic's over. You can't park here. We do not care. <laughs> You know, and that, that part, they really don't. And it's it's just, um, you know, I didn't want to disrespect them. I've already, you know, I've been to jail. I know how to speak at, in a manner where, you know, someone's going to respect my opinion. And and uh, it was crazy. You should have seen that guy's face, you know, like me being all tied up. He didn't expect me to just be as polite as I was being and just to address to him, you know, how stupid this is and what, what I'm doing parked here, you know, and I could have gone more and more and, you know, telling me that, you know, the emissions and this and that. So then I talked to him about the death tank and he's just nodding like, you know what? And that's why in the end, he was like, you know, I, I do see where you're coming from, you know, but at the end of the day, I didn't expect that video to really do anything for anybody. I literally was doing it for my safety. You know, it was a white cop and I am a Hispanic man or, you know, a darker shade of brown, you know, and I was doing it for my protection. I wasn't doing it like, oh, I'm going to tell him. Nah, I just had it open. Like, hopefully this dude don't try to shoot me, try to tell me that anything or try to pull me out of my car. That's why I recorded it. Man, you know what? You know what? The service we provide and the shit you guys give us is unreal. You know what I mean? We we deliver goods across the nation and we get problems for parking. You know what I mean? Like we provide a real service and the fact that you guys even take that law serious for the you know, you guys wouldn't even have Christmas gifts or food or it's unreal the disrespect that we get for parking or having our truck on or you know trying to feed our family because we live around the corner you know what i mean and that's it's depressing that you have to be abiding to that law but you know don't worry about it we'll pay for this 75 dollars ticket after we work what two weeks on the road without seeing our family you know what i mean and we'll take the 75 dollars ticket just to go see our kids for about three days Go back on the road and deliver your guys' goods. It, and and I, the fact that you know that it's a ridiculous law and it's sad, but don't worry about it. We pay our taxes, we pay our fuel, and it's and emissions. You know, we have death tanks in here. The emissions are fine. You know what I mean? So the fact that it's not my idling because I go by code. If I go to the DOT inspection of the highway and I get searched or if I get any inspections, I pass because my emissions are perfectly fine. So, I mean, it's, it's just it's just a joke what you guys do to us. You know what I mean? It's a joke. The fact that we got to go through this for parking. I'm not leaking on your floor. I'm not... I'm just trying to spend time with my kid. You know what I mean? Luckily, he went to school. I might even get another ticket for doing a U-turn. You guys just, nothing else to do but to mess with the truck drivers these days. You know what I mean? But don't worry about it. We'll pay our tickets like we pay our taxes, like we pay every single little thing we pay for the whole United States to get their goods. No worries. I appreciate you saying that. Thank you. You too. And once I was done telling them, you know, 
what I told them, I just posted it. I didn't post it for me to be like, oh, I'm, I'm saying, I was just saying how I feel. I was just, I'm tired of a lot of things in this industry. And after I heard it, I was just like, you know what, I'm going to post that. I'm pretty sure a lot of truck drivers would appreciate me giving that output to a guy who gets to go home to his family every day, you know? I appreciate that. And that's how I came across it, man. So so thank you very much for that. And a lot of a lot of these people, they really don't understand. I mean, some of them do. Shout out to them. But a lot of y'all don't. Y'all, y'all want us to get out the way. Y'all, y'all don't, y'all, y'all, y'all think we taking, y'all, we driving too slow. Y'all want to cut us off. Y'all, y'all want to charge us X amount of dollars. Y'all, y'all want to, y'all, y'all say that y'all need y'all stuff, but y'all not giving us nowhere to park so we can get some sleep so we can drive these roads safe. Y'all not doing that. Y'all, y'all taking away all of the available spots. Y'all, y'all making it much more harder for us to to get our rest, and 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 you are making it more uh more loss, safety loss on the road. But all you got to do is 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 give us more places to park. We we live in a we we have our own homes. We got we we got our own homes, and we got a whole land right there. We park our truck on there, but now it's a problem. Because other people don't 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 want to see our trucks in our driveway, so they'll call the cops or the homeowners association to come over there and tell us, "Oh, well, you can't park on your land. It's my land. Where I, I'm, I, I live in a small city where where the pilot is not even a truck stop. It's just a fuel stop. That's it." There's there's no parking over there. But yet we we can't park in our own yards. We can't park in these rest areas no more. But then again, on the flip side of that, I get what you're saying. When one person finds that prime space and you think it's all yours, all of a sudden a, it, it, it's just it's a it's a it's a beautiful thing what's going on. You know why? Because with all these things going on with the rates and all these things going on, like, like, man, people used to buy me lunch when I would get out of my truck, you know, during the pandemic, they'd be like, oh, no, no, let us buy you lunch. And, I, and I'd be like, what? Like, no, I got it. Like, I'm, I'm, I, that's my truck. Oh, no, no, we appreciate what you do. Thank you so much. And boom, boom, boom. Like, I bet you if at any point in time, a firefighter and a fire truck park somewhere, they ain't going to tell them nothing. They're not going to put a ticket on them. You know what I mean? Because the job's respected for them. Our job isn't looked at with that kind of respect, you know. It's um, it was, but it, it just it just seems unfair to do so much for the world, you know what I mean? To do so much and to get things, it should be like, hey, you know, uh, we put a warning on your window. Um, just try not to, you know, not like, you know, it, it's just it's just crazy. It's unreal uh, how how things have changed because nobody's dying around the world. We're still doing the same job, you know. And, and uh, the beautiful thing about it with all these regulations in California and everything going on is so many people are going out of business and it's it's leveraging the 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 amount of work that they can move, you know. And if you go look at the load board right now, it's full of loads. And the reason is because they done ran everybody out of business in California, you know. And the strong are going to survive. And, and it's unfortunate for the people who have had to close doors, but we sleep in parking lots. Man, you know, we sleep on the side of the freeway, and and the fact that this this industry isn't respected like it was, and and, and you know you got you got officers like being like, oh, and you guys already know the rules, and boom, 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 like man, that badge, those guns, that car came all came in a truck, man, and 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 yeah, I know my laws, but give us a break, like you know what I'm saying, like give us. Give us a warning. Give us a something. You know what I mean? And, and it is what it is, man. Like I said, I made that video for my safety. I didn't even make that video to say, "Hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna post this." Like, nah, man. I was just like, I wonder what this police is gonna say that you know I gotta be careful with. You know. So, how before we move on, how how is parking in in California, bro? Like. I mean, I I I talk to a, I I talk to a lot of drivers, and they say parking is like, it's like scarce, really. Yeah, 
there's nothing. There's nothing. Like you there there's uh there's like three truck stops in one end of California, four truck stops, and they're not for parking. They're for fueling and leaving. You know what I mean? And uh, I I you know, I have a parking spot that I park by my house that I would get tickets at all the time. And I walked up to the parking lady and I said, Look, miss, like I'm gonna have to keep parking here because this is where I live at. And I don't have a parking. She's like, nope, nope, da da da, da. And like, um, I'm going to keep putting tickets there every time I see you there. And I looked at her kindly and I was like, look, man, it's like, if you could help me and my family out by not leaving me tickets, I would really appreciate that, you know. Um, but I understand you're just doing your job. And, and, you know, at the end of the day, you pay $40 a night to go to a, a you know, a parking spot to leave your car there. So 75 bucks for three days is a deal, if you ask me, you know. And um, so one day the tickets stopped coming. The tickets stopped coming when I would park it at the house. And I seen the parking lady again one day and she was just watching me warm up my truck and I got out of my car and I was like, hey, you know, thank you so much for not leaving the tickets no more. Like, I really need this parking space and I'm hardly here. She goes, look, as long as nobody's calling the cops on you or nobody's calling parking enforcement, you'd be all right. So there are some people who just, you know, really turn the cheek because they know that they're just a regular human in that car and that, that truck just trying to go home for a few days and take off, you know. And I've been very, very, very blessed to have that lady turn the cheek, you know. And in that side of the town, it's like I think it's ninety eight dollars for the truck and trailer out of the take home. But there's no parking out there. There's no parking. There's even some Walmarts where you think you could park where it has the it has no overnight parking signs everywhere, you know. And uh, when you do go to the truck stops, you got to park next to the warehouses. And then when the warehouse is open, they kick you out. Like, it's it's a little bit less than scared. It's like, there's nothing. Like, like and, and then, like, the small truck stops that we do have, like, they're not even sized properly to where, like, if you try to park, you're going to hit another truck, you know? Glad I don't have to go out that way. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a motherfucker. It's, a, it's, it's, it's something else. But to all the truck drivers here in this man. Who don't get the love like man I, I pray i pray that you guys start getting appreciated i pray we all just start getting paid more and uh, i just I'm, I'm with you guys i'm on your team man and if, if that was something that that did something for you guys man i was literally just recording that video for my safety but if i said some words that you've been dying to say for a long time i'm glad i was able to say that i'm glad i was able to give me that perspective of finally somebody said something. that's what i did in that video man i'm, I'm, I'm glad i did Hmm. This is a tasty burger. Finally. All right. So, my man, you you mentioned an issue with the highway patrol, man. Take us back to what happened to that, man. What what happened? Yeah, I'm gonna post that video soon too. I'm gonna blank out the guy's face, but I got pulled over knowing I wasn't speeding, and the reason why I got pulled over is because when I seen the highway patrol, he was behind a little mountain, like a little sand mountain. And, uh, you know, being in this industry long enough, you learn a few things and you stop being scared of certain situations. You know, if your paperwork's right, you're running the motherfuckers to go kiss your ass, you know. And um, the guy comes up to me. He's like, oh, you were speeding. I was like, sir, I was not speeding. Do you, what, do, were you using your radar? He's like, no. I was like, so how would you know I was speeding? Oh, because I was able to visually estimate your speed. I was like, well, that's not going to hold up in court. And I, I have, you know. Shout out to TVC. I have TVC and they do get me out of tickets, you know, especially tickets that I didn't do. And I told them, I was like, well, that's not going to hold up in court. So just know I'm going to fight this ticket and you're just bored. And the reason why you stopped me is because I had just changed the brakes on my trailer. So they were grabbing on real good. So when I pressed the brake, it made like a little smoke thing, you know, like the tires dragged a little bit. And that's why he pulled me over. I was like, you're not going to tell me I was pulling over when I was on. And I know I was on cruise control. And I was like, and I have a camera on my dash that also shows the speed limit that I'm going. And I was like, so he goes, oh, well, I did have on my LIDAR. And I was like, your LIDAR? You just said that. I was like, what the hell is a LIDAR? He's like, it's a, it's a laser radar. I was like, but I just asked you if you had a radar. He goes, no, but I have a LIDAR. He's like, like now you're just switching up your story. And I was like, what it is, is you're just bored. You guys are bored. You're right here on the freeway and you're bored. And I, I caught the whole thing of where like, well, when you want to ask for some lenience in the courthouse, 
just know who they're going to ask. I was like, they're not going to ask you. I was like, it's, it's what's proven. And I'm proving. I, I, I'm going to take my camera. I'm going to take all my stuff to show them that I wasn't speaking. So I'll see you in court. And uh, literally when I told them, I said, like, well, just sign here. I have it all on camera, too. I love it. And when I, um, the, the day of court, he didn't show up. He didn't show up, so they, they just, uh, they, they uh, I don't know out. what the correct terminology for it. Throw, throw it yeah, out. Throw out the case. Throw out the case. Yeah, because I'm not that's, fool. That's the correct you know? terminology. Throw it out. Yep. If if they don't show up to prove the prosecutor's case, then, yeah, they're going to throw it out. Case dismissed. Nets case. Just look at yeah. your honor and, he and knows, be like, thank you. And, 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 and to all the truck drivers listening to this, if your papers are clean, and 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 you're writing good and everything is straight your logbook is straight do not let those people talk to you like you're some type of criminal already because that's how they oh sit down get up boom 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 like sir i don't know who the fuck you're talking to but you're not going to talk to me like that you know like even when i go on the scale like i pull out my phone i have other videos when i go on the scale and the guy's like oh i'm pulling you i'm pulling you in because you're overweight on your scale but how am i overweight what are you talking about this load is coming from florida i didn't pass 30 scales before I got into California. He goes, oh, do you have your scale ticket? I was like, I don't need my scale ticket. I know I'm not overweight. And then as he's talking shit to me and I have my phone out, I said, I'm just letting you know I'm documenting all this. And then you hear other trucks that are overweight ring the little ding, 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 ding. And that means that they're overweight. And I was like, why aren't you pulling them in? And he goes, oh, because I'm busy with you. I was like, okay, so now we're just letting in other trucks with overweight. I was like, don't even worry about it. He goes, oh, well, uh, then he went to go inspect my truck. I recorded every single little thing, every single little thing. And I spoke as an owner operator, not as a criminal. Like they try to talk to you, try to tell you, oh, sit down. Do it. No, I said, I don't want to sit down. I'm going to stand up. And they can't tell you to sit down. They're not allowed. You're, 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 they're, they're just providing a service, you know? And they like to talk to us truck drivers like we're already in handcuffs. Like, nah. And as I started getting my knowledge, like I did everything else in this industry, I do not let those people talk. If they want, if they come at me respectfully, I'm a respectful person. But be sure you pull out your phone because these people are acting out of policy when they don't. As soon as you pull out that phone, you'll see their whole demeanor change. You'll see them act in the con and conduct themselves the way they're supposed to. So if you're a truck driver and you're you get pulled into a scale, you get pulled over any situation, pull your phone out. Pull your phone out and see how they act completely different. But that 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 uh that scale ticket that they try to give me for, he he uh, he let me go for it too, and they and they let it pass in court. And it's all because I document everything, and it's very important to document everything. Man, awesome conversation, bro. I learned something today. <laughs> I learned something today. Hey, man, we we I and learned I today, you bro. Having me on, man. Not a problem, man. You you more than welcome to uh come and share share any and everything with us over here at the uh recorder call channel, man. Thank you. Uh in too deep like Omar. Make me wanna track you down and hit the track hawk with the crowbar. I knew we wouldn't go far, like we ran out of ethanol. Now your nosy ass mama wanna get involved. When I met you, you was on the couch with the plastic. She need an Emmy, bitch so dramatic. Now your baggage got me on edge like jagged. Fucking up my homes, look Patrick. You swift to jump shift like a chief. Been crying on my line like Therese. But it ain't all you, it's me. Blame it on the things I went through.